Good evening. Welcome, everybody, to the seventh in our series of nature, climate and soil friendly food production and land use. And that gorgeous piece of music we just listened to was called Mother Earth by Waki Kuna. And tonight I'm honored to introduce to you somebody who's been farming in harmony with Mother Earth for the past 30 years. Um, I've often heard Ian Tolhurst say that the primary product of his farm is biodiversity and that food production is second. Having said that though, he does produce a heck of a lot of food to the tune of around 120 tons of veg and fruit per year uh, from just 19 acres of what was considered low grade farmland until Ian got his hands on it. Um, Ian started his farming career um, by working for four years on a large dairy farm. He's been a commercial organic producer since 1976. And for the past 30 years, he's been farming stock free organically. He is a world renowned, if not the world renowned expert on stock free organic growing. And he does advising too. In fact, we're honored to have him as a member of our stock free advisory team. Um, so let's welcome Ian Tolhurst. Just a quick reminder, the chat will be off throughout the duration of the webinar. So if you do have questions, and I hope you have tons of them, uh, please pop them in the Q&A and we will save those to the end and ask Ian those questions at the end. So uh, make yourselves comfy and let's welcome Ian Tolhurst. Right, thank you very much for that, Rebecca. So yeah, we're going to be looking at a system, a farming system tonight. Now, we are going to cover some degree of pest and disease control, but also fertility, but we're really going to be looking at what is really a farming system. And this picture, the opening slide here is um, part of my farm. There's two fields there, the one in the immediate foreground, which is divided up with agroforestry, is about three hectares. And the one behind, which is behind the hedge, is about just over four hectares. So it comes to about 18 or 19 acres altogether. And we're situated in the southern part of UK, about 40 miles west of London. Uh, the coast is about 35 miles to the south. And we are very close to the River Thames. In fact, you can see the River Thames just about uh, behind the trees in, in that picture. So fertility, no livestock. So as Rebecca said, we've been doing this for a very long time. In fact, we've been um, organic farming since 1976, but we've only been sort of officially stock free for the last 18 years since we developed the stock free organic standards for horticulture. So why stock free? Well, this didn't come about by design, this system that I have now. It really came about more by default, really. Um, the whole idea really is to be using far less land to produce more food. So we're not importing fertility from elsewhere. We're not using somebody else's land, which we refer to as ghost acres. And many horticulturists are bringing in large amounts of bulky material, either in the form of manures or other material from, from somebody else's land. So we're not doing that. It's very near to a closed system. In fact, we're trying to close the system increasingly all the time. And we are aiming towards the system will be virtually completely closed with the exception of maybe buying in seed is very productive. We've shown that high productivity is certainly very um, capable and able in, in this system, has a very low carbon footprint. There's no reliance on animal culture. We don't need livestock at all to produce these crops. It avoids the problems of sourcing inputs and it's suitable not just for vegetable production, but for arable cropping as well. So this could be rolled out to a much larger scale. So our farm business originally established in 1976. I'm one of the original organic uh, producers in the UK. Uh, we're on our present site. We've been on for 35 years and we've been stock free the whole time, but only actually certified as stock free since I think it was about nine, uh, 2004 or five. Um, we have three symbols there. We have the one in the middle, which is the Soil Association organic symbol we've had since 1976, the certified stock free one, uh, which is the vegan organic network certification system we've had since I think 2006, uh, and our own logo, which we've been displaying since we became a community interest company about six years ago. We're producing well over 100 different crops, um, anything from 
20, 50 square meters of herbs to 10,000 square meters of potatoes and other major crops. And around between 120 and 140 tons of food a year. It's self-sufficient, um, it's a low carbon footprint. Virtually all of our sales are very local. In fact, something like 80% of our sales is, is within a eight mile radius of the farm. Um, we do advisory from the farm. We do a lot of farm walks. We have farm walks on a very regular basis. We have one coming up um, this weekend for about 25 people. We do seminars and increasingly now more webinars and seminars. And we do food festivals and fairs. We have several food fairs during the year to promote what we do and to keep, keep our customers interested. And we have um, regular trials work. We've been doing trials work for the last uh, 35 years, mostly in conjunction with the Organic Research Centre, but also with other agencies as well. All the pictures are from the farm. This is a crop of onions from a few years ago. Um, our marketing is really important for us that everything is sold locally. So we're doing as much as we can through the bot scheme, pretty much half of everything. And then the farm shop takes up almost everything else. And we do a little bit to local shops as well. This is our, <clears throat> our field cropping. And you can see there's a range of different features there. We're quite lucky to be in a quite a biodiverse rich part of the country. Um, it's not good quality agricultural land. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. It's quite poor. And originally it was, it has been grassland for a very, very long time. It was ploughed during the war because of the need for increased food. In fact, the um, UK was very successful producing most of its food during the war um, as a result of very much reduced livestock numbers. Um, our field cropping is quite extensive. We have a whole range of different crops, but these are really primarily staple crops. So we have potatoes, a um, very large number of different brassicas, onions, alliums with leeks. Um, squash is now one of our major important staple crops. And this year we produced over 7,000 squash, um, most of which are present in the store. Um, and then we have a wall garden, which is just a few hundred meters away from the field. It's an old ancient wall garden that's been used for thousands of years. Um, it's quite steep, it's quite stony, all our land is quite stony. Um, it's a good site, it's early, very um, very warm, facing south, um, and that's where we have most of our early production and late production. We grow strawberries there, we have quite a large area of strawberries. We, we produce around two tonnes of strawberries every, every summer. And, and we have tunnel crops. We have over 1,600 square meters of tunnel crops, uh, a whole range of crops. We have something like 35 or 40 different crops that we grow in tunnels. And we do all our own plant propagation using our own home produced plant substrate, which is made completely from wood chip uh, compost. Um, and we produce around 70,000 modules and around 80,000 peg plants a year. Um, most of the peg plants go to the field and the modules, most of those go to the field, but some do stay in the garden. Um, and the picture you see there would be taken probably about the middle of March and that's tomato plants coming on there. And then the outdoor bed, we have a <clears throat> whole range of brassicas in, in trays there ready to go out to the field. The greenhouse is very old, it's 100 years old. It's our oldest working building. Um, our soil is really not what you call horticultural land. It's, it's, not, it's nothing like grade one, it's grade 3B. Um, it's a clay loam over chalk, has a very high pH. It's a mix, mixture of alluvial and glacial. Uh, it's pretty shallow. Our maximum depth is, is around 250 millimeters. In, in some places, it's less than that. We have very high stone content, of more than 40% of stone over 10 millimeter. And originally we, we inherited very low P and K um, indices. It was pretty dire actually, and we've improved that quite significantly over, over many years. It's, it is very free draining, which is a, a real bonus. And it is now very biologically active. We have more than a thousand earthworms uh, per meter. Uh, should be per meter, not per hectare. We have uh, 10 million per hectare. Um, and we've just recently had a very, um, very interesting carbon study done of our soils done by AgriCarbon, who did it 
completely for free, which is incredibly generous of them. Now they took over 180 samples across all of our fields in, in every rotational plot. And they've come up with some really interesting data. I won't go into too much detail, but we have 81 tons of carbon per hectare, which is slightly more than we started with um, 40, 35 years ago. So it's encouraging to know that we are maintaining our carbon level. <clears throat> so where is our fertility coming from? Well, initially, primarily, it's coming from the soil. Um, even very poor quality soils and, and, and badly, previously badly managed soils have the ability to, to rejuvenate and to become very productive. Uh, even the, the most desertified soil will, in time, with the right care, can be made very productive. So our fertility is primarily coming from within the soil itself. And we, we're unlocking all the nutrients that should be locked up through primarily through lack of biological activity over many years, many generations of farming, really. But we also use green manures, and everything here is really about encouraging the biological activity of the soil, the, the biome, as we now refer to it. So green manures are really important, a whole range of different deep-rooting green manures, a wide range of species. Every, every different plant you grow in your soil will have a, a different association of a whole range of fungi and bacteria, and this is the, the lifeblood of the soil. Wood chip has been really useful for encouraging this biological activity. It's we use in composted wood chip, but we're also using ramule chip wood. I'll tell you more about that later. The rotation is critical in terms of allowing us time and space to to use green manures and to use fertility building and appropriate soil management in terms of not disturbing more than we have to, the, the, the biome in the soil and trying to preserve the earthworms and the living population of the soil as much as possible. We've never used any fertilizers of any type, organic or otherwise, on, on this land. So we've had 35 years with no fertilizers at all, which is pretty unusual. And it's caused a lot of interest in the agricultural world, people wondering how we managed to produce such a lot from so, potentially so little. The soil is, for us, it's the ultimate biodiversity. And it's the thing we, we, we probably spend more effort on the farm than anything else. And the whole pest disease cycle and the whole fertility building cycle is, is really completely dependent on this diversity in the soil. So we have a whole range of strategies to make sure we, <clears throat> we look after the soil in the best possible way. And it's really about <clears throat> being light and not too heavy. <coughs> excuse me, encouraging a whole range of <coughs> plant types with different plant roots. So the range of plant roots is, is really important. It doesn't matter how much organic material you put on soil, you'll never get the same effect that you'll get with the diverse range of plant roots. And roots from different plant sources have different ways of dealing with their nutrient demands. Uh, the earthworm is a really good indicator, and we can learn a lot from our soil by the way the earthworm uh, increases or decreases, uh, how it behaves, how it breeds, the size, the age, uh, and also the number of species. We have, um, I think we have eight or nine species of earthworm now, one of which is only found in woodland soils, which is very interesting. And this has come about as a result of using wood chip, I think. And the ultimate aim really is, is the minimal aim is to retain the carbon, but we also want to increase carbon because carbon has been over many, many <clears throat> generations of farming has been lost. Even going back pre pre war, carbon was being lost. I mean, carbon has been lost ever since man started to to use soil in 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 often the wrong way. So it's really about increasing the carbon content, and we have seen um, a small increase in carbon over 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 a long period of time, which is encouraging because we've also produced a lot of food at the same time. So one of the main elements of feeding the soil for us is, is the use of, of green manures. It's fertility from, from the farm. We only need, the only thing we need to do is buy seed. That's quite a small amount. It's really valuable contributed by diversity. So green manures are not just about building fertility and building carbon. They're also really good at building uh, predator populations to control pests and to increase the whole insect uh, by biological activity. <clears throat> and and all the various microbes that we need to make the soil healthy and, and capable. They're really good at recycling nutrients, uh, able to take nutrients from the soil, hold it in the plant over winter, keep it out again in the spring. So we're using green manure in, in a variety of ways. And we're also really careful about 
not losing material from the farm in terms of nutrients. So all waste material, anything we take from greenhouses and tunnels when we finish cropping all gets recycled, it goes to compost, gets treated with the wood chip compost. Um, and we're aiming really for a system which is as far as possible a closed system. We do crop something like 70% of our land. So we're not cropping 100% of our land. I don't think this is possible. We, we need that 30%. This is the resting phase and it, it's part of a rotation. It moves around the farm, but we need that, that period of time when the soil is resting, it's rejuvenating, it's building fertility, it's building earthworm populations, it's building biological diversity. This is really important. We could not continue to crop this land 100% all the time without falling into problems. This is where many people <clears throat> decide to bring in large amounts of material from somewhere else in order to make up that fertility loss. Um, and that doesn't have the same effect on soil as growing green manure crops will. There's a few examples here of some of the green manures we use. We're getting increasingly adventurous with green manures, but um, the main longer term fertility building one, which is the pictures you see there, this is green manures which are down for two and a half years, are primarily based on, on legumes and grasses. Uh, and chicory, chicory is a fantastic plant to have in a green manure because it's very deep rooting. But we also add a lot of wildflowers, we're adding around 30 or 40 different species of wildflower now to our mix. But we also have a whole range of short term green manures that we use mostly over winter, they're mostly uh, relay sown into crops. Relay sowing is where we under sow into a crop. And this is a technology we've developed <clears throat> very much on our farm over quite a few years. Um, other people are also now starting to use some of this technology as well. It works really well in, in terms of keeping nutrients in. Um, and also it's really fantastically good for keeping predators on the farm, which is really important to us. The whole fertility and pest and disease cycle are, are not something we can look at as independence. They are all part of the whole system. So here we've got some tomatoes in greenhouses. This is under sown with a mixture of Persian clover and yellow truffle. We usually eat, try to use more than one species of green manure. We, we aim for, in most cases, multiple species. We do occasionally use single species, but we generally go for multiple species because it encourages multiple fungi and bacteria associations with the soil. This is a really great way of improving pest priority balance. Most pests are a real problem where you have bare soil. They're much more of a problem on bare soil than they are on soil which is covered with green material. Improves the uh, soil fauna and fertility. So all the various microbes and, and bacteria and fungi which associate with these different plants, they, they become present. These things move in very quickly, within weeks of a plant establishing itself. Help to control some weeds, um, really good for overwintering protection of soil. This is really important. We, we, we never have any bare soil over winter. It's always protected with green manure or um, a growing crop and very often both. We often have green manures and overwintering crops at the same time. And these green manures really allow for a period of time when the soil is, is, is in a stable condition, when there's no tillage, there's, 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 there's virtually no physical interaction with the soil at all from human beings or machinery or anything. So it's really good way of improving soil biological life. And here we have uh, relay green manure where we've under sown squash. These squash were under sown just four weeks after planting. Um, we have a very diverse mix there with um, over 30 or 40 species of plant. And this will actually become the, the fertility building green manure crop for, for the next two years when we have no crop at all. This is for two years out of the seven in the rotation. Um, squash are one crop which have done particularly well for us and this year has been fantastic because the weather is just absolutely superb. Um, and this is how it, this green manure will look in the spring. Um, at the moment some of these flowers are flowering now because we have the, the most weird weather. I mean it's been incredibly warm apart from the last two days. Um, and some of this stuff which was sown in the summer it's starting to flower now which is slightly worrying because we don't know what's going to happen next year but this is how it would should be looking in April and May. It's very very rich in flowers. We, we you know we encourage this diversity. We don't mind that these flowers are going to set seed and it's going to drop off onto the ground because we actually want to increase that that seed bank to increase the range of species within that seed bank is, is really important to us. 
Um, and here we've got example in the wall garden where we're, we have courgettes growing within a, <clears throat> a living mulch of green manure. Again, this would be multiple species. And the previous year to this, it would have been runner beans or French beans growing in, in the same spaces. So we've just cleared a little patch between what was the beans and planted courgettes. And this is a really good way of feeding the soil. We never think about feeding plants. We only ever consider feeding soil. We have no policy at all for feeding plants. We don't use any liquid manures. We don't give any plants any special treatment. We just feed the soil and let plants feed themselves. I think this is a much more natural approach because, <clears throat> you know, I don't really understand what plants need from soil with people claim that they do, but I think the plant knows better. So we, we let them make up their own minds as to what they can gather from the soil. Um, rotations are a really important part of the whole of our system. Um, the picture here, this is sweet corn, which has been relay sown with a mixture of green manures. It looks like some Cecilia, a bit of white clover maybe there. Um, the rotation is, is, is really there to optimise fertility, and we use the word optimise rather than maximise. Um, we're not really interested in maximising of anything. We want to optimise. We want to make sure that the, the, the soil is working to its optimum capacity and rather than pushing it beyond where it should really feel comfortable to be. And also rotations are really important for controlling weeds. Different crops encourage different weeds, different green manures encourage different weeds. And we, 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 we like this range of different weeds. We don't want the same weed year in, year out. When I first came here, we only really had about four or five weeds. Now we have, you know, hundred, well not hundred, but almost hundred different types. And this is really important. This is healthy. Biodiversity is such an important thing to have on a farm. But also rotations will reduce or eliminate pests and disease problems. We inherited two quite bad soil-borne diseases here in the wall garden. We have onion white rot, which is pretty much common in most wall gardens, uh, but also for Sicilian wilt as a result of um, extensive potato production during, during the war years. So we've had to deal with these diseases and we've managed to get to levels where we, we rarely see any, any effect at all now. And this is partly due to rotation, but also partly due to increased soil health. So the principles of rotation are really important. It's really keeping soil covered at all times as much as possible. We only open soil up for relatively short periods of time. Increasing organic matter or soil carbon precisely um, is really important too because you know soil cannot function without soil carbon. You cannot increase microbes and have a healthy soil if soil carbon is, is being depleted. We're alternating weed susceptible crops with weed suppressing crops and um, we consider weeds very important they are things we like to have in the right place in the rotation at the right time there are times when we have zero tolerance to weeds um, in the early, early stage of the cropping but beyond once the crop is established we're quite happy to allow weeds to establish but you know rotation is a really important way of controlling those weeds and we're balancing soil fertility with exploitative cropping so this is where it's really important we have this fairly long-term green manure, which is building fertility, building soil health. Uh, and then we are exploiting that for future cropping, but at the same time as exploiting, we're also building short-term into the rotation, other elements of green manure as well. Different root systems are essential. Uh, every, every crop has a different requirement in terms of what it takes from the soil. So a range of different root crops will exploit different levels of soil. Um, and we're really keen to have lots of really deep rooting material. And this is where green manures come in because you don't, most crops are not that deep rooting apart from things like parsnips and carrots, but most crops are relatively shallow. So having deep rooting plants within the green manure is really important. Uh, legumes break crops. Um, we have used a lot of legumes within the rotation. They are legumes which we don't harvest. Um, a legume could be a bean crop, but that's not fertility building, it doesn't build any fertility. So we're growing legumes primarily for fertility building, that's mostly clovers, lucerne and, and trefoils. And we're trying to reduce the possible risk of disease by keeping like-minded or like family crops distant from each other. And, and in our case, we have a seven year rotation. So potatoes, for example, don't come back to the same plot for seven years. This is uh, brassicas a couple of years ago. Um, I call this my 50 shades of green. Uh, we have in that particular year, we had 36, I think, different brassica species growing there. Everything from different 
broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, cabbage, winter cabbage, spring cabbage, summer cabbage, spring greens, the list is endless. And brassicas are one of our, our major crops. Um, the principles of rotation design, I think is so which I probably won't spend too much time on, but you need to know a lot about your sites. You need to know something about your soil. You need to know how it's going to behave. Um, there's a lot of factors to consider when you design the rotation and every farm really is a, is a separate rotational challenge. Um, you need to know what the limitations of your farm and your soil are before you can really start to build rotation design. We have three separate rotations here. We have the field rotation, which is on uh, 17, 18 acres. We have garden rotation, which is on two. And then we have the polytunnel rotation, which is on uh, one nearly 2,000 square meters. This is our actual rotation field. Um, <clears throat> year one and two is, is the red clover, lucerne, and, and a whole range of, of other species. We have now something like 30 or 40 species within that green manure. It's cut and mulched. Nothing, nothing is removed. During the late winter, we will apply compost with wood chip to this, to this area, to these one and two years, and also ramiel chip wood, which we've now started using as well. The first actual crop in year is potatoes, and as soon as they're out, we'll follow this with a green manure, over winter green manure, which could be clover vetch. Um, there's a whole range of different species. We tend to use different ones at uh, different times, so we break the monotony of, of, of plant species. Um, the following year, year four, is brassicas, um, these are mostly winter spring cropping, we're, we're cropping now. These are under sown. We've, we used to use cereal rye, but now we're using a much more diverse range of species, flowering plants as well, which will flower in the spring. This really helps with, with pest control. Year five is alliums, mostly onions and leeks. And these are intercropped with clover and then under sown with, with um, cereal rye during the winter for the oats, <coughs> for, the, um, <coughs> for the leeks. And year six is root crops, which is primarily carrots, parsnips, but also celeriac, beetroot, and some other things as well. Um, this is the only year we don't have an under sowing green manure. So it's one year out of seven, we don't actually have a green manure in, as part of that rotation. And the final year is, is, is a mixture of sweet corn and squash. They're not grown together, they're grown separately. And they're under sown with, with the year one and two red clover um, legume high species mix again. And that's just the back to the year, year one of the rotation. So it's quite a long rotation. We've been around the field now, um, I don't know how many times, um, five times so far. Um, and it's each time we go around, it gets better. So here we are, here's the long-term fertility builder. Um, and this has been in place for over two years. Um, we get fantastic growth. It's, it's mown in the spring, well, late spring, and late summer. We only generally now mow it twice. It's mowing with flail mower and then we apply some wood chip to that in the winter. Uh, potatoes go in first part of the rotation because they're a hungry crop. We've, we've had some pretty good yields the last few years. We used to get quite poor yields many years ago but we've got some really stunningly high yields now. A uh, really satisfying crop to grow. They're, they're a very simple, very easy crop to grow and um, we store through the winter. And then the brassicas, um, these you can see the picture on the right. You can just see there's a, a green cover there between the rows. This is the under sowing. We've under sowed that with a mixture of legumes and flowering plants. This picture would have been taken sometime probably around uh, end of August, early September. Onions and leeks. Um, these are uh, grown in, in rows. Well, all our crops are growing in rows. Um, the leeks are under sown during the, the late part of the autumn. And the onions, as soon as we harvest the onions, which is usually around, um, we're quite early, we usually harvest by about first, second week in August. Um, once they're off the ground, we, 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 we sow a green manure there, which now covers the whole winter. And looking at where the onions were this year, we have a green manure, which is now almost three foot high and starting to flower. The hills in the background, this is Chilton Hills, you can see, how very dry this was. This was not this, this year gone. This was just a, a normal year. We, we do experience quite a lot of drought in this part of the country. Our annual rainfall is only about 550 millimetres. In fact, in the last month, in the last four weeks, we have had 140 millimetres of rain, which is pretty much 25% of our annual rainfall. So it's been incredibly wet. You just see there top 
right of that picture, that's the irrigation system where we have a, a large scale irrigation system. Uh, we wouldn't be growing much here without irrigation. It's a very dry part of the country, very dry soil. Uh, year six is root crops. Here we've got um, in the middle two rows of fennel. That's the irrigation pipe running up to the sprinkler. To the right of that, we've got the uh, chicory. And then beyond that, we have parsnips. And then to the left, we have carrots and, and more carrots. So the root crops are they're all sown direct. They're the most challenging crop for weed control in the early stages. But once they're established, it's pretty straightforward. We, we reach most of our crops up during the growing phase and then allow the green manure to establish once the crop is well, well established. And the final crop is, is the squash, which um, <clears throat> we seem to be growing more, <clears throat> more and more each year because um, there is quite a good demand for it. We grow around 2,000, 2,500 plants. Um, and this is where we under sow the long-term fertility green manure. So it's usually sown around about the middle of summer, sort of middle of, uh, end of June, early July is the target date. We don't plant squash until the end of the first week in June, because we, we do have frost sometimes here in early June. So we, we always like late planting. Um, squash has been a, <clears throat> a really good crop for us. It, it works really well. Right. Pest and disease really is, is really dependent on, on the whole system of the farm. And I, I want to try and explain what this system really means and, and what it is. Um, it's what I refer to the systems approach and the definition of that is a complex whole set of connected things or parts. Um, people always want to know what a particular way of dealing with a specific pest is. And it's never an easy answer. It's never, oh, we use so-and-so because we don't actually use anything at all for pest control. We don't use any products, we don't spray anything. Uh, what we use, we, we, we use the system, which is increasingly becoming biologically diverse and very biologically um, rich. And it's having the right balance of, <clears throat> of predators. It's really important. And it's not we're not able to think about pest diseases, fertility in isolation. They are <clears throat> part and parcel of the whole picture of the farm. So we look at the farm as a complete total organism as near as possible. It's, it's relatively isolated from the outside world in that we don't bring much in apart from seed. So we are in, in isolation in that sense. Um, and you know, we've had to develop an understanding about how this farm operates, this whole farm system operates. If we were to take just one component of that system out, if we were to remove the earthworms from our farm completely, this would have a, a dramatic effect on soil quality and soil health, which would then impact on the crops themselves, which would then become sick and unhealthy, and they would get pests and diseases. And you may wonder why. Well, as soon as you remove the earthworm, you remove the soil's ability to drain itself, you remove the soil's ability to, to recycle nutrients, to recycle organic material. Um, and the earthworm is such an important part of this process, but that's just one part of the whole process. There are so many things happening in soil, many of which we have no understanding of. So, you know, the, the system is really dependent on the whole system's approach. So we are looking at this farm as being a complete organism. Um, it is a biological functioning system. And that's the reason we are passionate about trying to encourage biodiversity and the way we manage the soil is very much um, towards, towards that end. So when I first came into growing um, almost 50 years ago, and I, as everybody does, you get big problems with pests and diseases, partly because you're, you're not experienced, but partly because you understand what's going on. And the feeling is that, you know, these pests and diseases are out to get you. And that's not the case at all. They're actually out to show you something. Um, beautiful pictures, some of our savoys that we picked uh, just a few days ago, they're looking absolutely fantastic this year. Uh, no pests, no diseases. You may wonder where what happened to caterpillars, I'll tell you about caterpillars later on. The idea of pests and disease is there for a reason, and it's selection, it's natural selection. Uh, <clears throat> many years ago we used to grow broad beans and we always got this infernal problem with black fly, and the ground usually we got less and then in the, in the end it disappeared completely because we had you know so many predators and we still get the occasional odd plant that has a bit of black fly i think this year there might have been 10 in um there was probably about 
10,000 plants. So, you know, one, one in a thousand plants was infected with black fly, completely infected and kind of shriveled up and died. And it's the reason black is there's something wrong with that plant. It's weak, it's not healthy, either because the genetics are maybe not quite right or something perhaps going on with that soil in that particular part of the field. So it's really about a process of nature making selections. And this is how nature works. It selects the weakest, takes them out and it does that through pests and disease it's the same for human beings we like to think it's not but we are subject to the same laws of nature we are potentially at risk of diseases and pests as you know we found out in the last two years um, we are not immune from this at all so that selection process is really nature's way of dealing with the sick and weakly so it's there for a real reason and if i get a pest problem or a disease problem with our crops i don't suddenly think oh why what you know why is this happening to us i want to know why it's happening to us and what we have done wrong as part of our farming system because it's nearly always something to do with what we've done it's a weakness somewhere we've not looked after fertility we've we've damaged some part of the system so nature has a really good way of showing us that something needs to be looked at in detail to find out what what's gone wrong and pest and disease is there for that reason so this whole system's approach is, is quite complex. <clears throat> it's a natural biological system. It works perfectly. We, you know, we, our, our lives are dominated by systems. We have them in our cars, we have them on our computers, our phones. I mean, our phone is a fantastic example of a system, a whole system. Um, but the farm is, is, is a system too. It is, it's very diverse. It's probably the most complex system you can possibly imagine, particularly when you start looking at soil. The rotation is, is really important in terms of making sure that it's sustainable. We want to be able to do this forever and it's healthy for the plants and for the crops. And it's appropriate. We, we need appropriate rotation systems depending on our climate, depending on the crops we want to grow, depending on our soil type. Tiny tillage, so much damage can be done. You can spend years building good, healthy soil and you can destroy that in just one inappropriate tillage at the wrong time of year in too wet or too dry or, or frozen and or too big a machine or too deep you can do an awful lot of damage in a very short space of time and that damage can take several seasons to, to repair again so tillage timely tillage appropriate tillage is really important choosing varieties we we are very lucky to be able to have choice of varieties for vegetables and there are many varieties which are resistant to diseases and, and some pests and we will tend to choose those where we have perhaps a, a problem of some type. I and mean, potatoes are a really good example. We used to get big problems with potato blight, sometimes lose almost half the crop many years ago. Now we, we, we have almost no problem at all with blight because there are some really good <clears throat> varieties which have come out of, out of Ukraine uh, where they had a very have had a very good breeding program for many, many decades. And those varieties only really came to the, the West as a result of the fall of the the Soviet Union. So, you know, good varieties are really important. We need a, a soil which is really healthy, biologically active, <clears throat> and balanced in nutrients. It's quite easy to say, but it's a very complex soil, is a very complex uh, organism, um, and it takes a lot of understanding in order to get that right. You don't need to be an expert, you, but you do need to have some idea of, of soil management. Appropriate cropping, you know, we wouldn't try and grow um, avocados here on this site because the climate's wrong. Um, so, you know, making sure we choose the right crops is, is very important. Planned management, all our crops are planned. They're planned um, many, many months, in fact, almost a year ahead. And we're aiming for optimization of fertility. We're not looking at maximizing fertility. You, know, you can maximize fertility, you can actually cause a lot of pests and disease problems. Aphids, for example, are a result very often too much nitrogen imbalance in the soil. So fertility is really important. And optimum weed control, and that optimum weed control may at times um, mean that we actually allow certain weeds to develop. They can be extremely important. And the ecology of the soil. So this system's approach is, is quite complex. Um, we like to use organic methods. We've been organic for almost 50 years. We, we feel this is the right way of doing things. Um, the principles of that should apply to any good system. And this should apply also to agroecological or regenerative farming, as some people like to call it. Um, and these principles are, are really 
core and fundamental to success of, a, of a, an organic production system. And it's very much about existing rather than dominating natural systems. And, and we've had to learn this sometimes the hard way over you know, quite a long period of time that you cannot dominate nature, you have to coexist with it. And this is really important that we, we learn to do this. Sustain and improve soil health, minimize pollution and degradation environment where if we farm in the right way, we, we shouldn't be causing pollution, we shouldn't be having nitrate or phosphate runoff, but we shouldn't be damaging the, the wider environment, we should be enhancing that environment, not damaging it. Minimize the use of non-renewables and, and we've gone a long way to doing that on the farm. We've got very low carbon footprint. We still have room for improvement, of course. We'd like to remove all elements of non-renewable if we could. Um, where animals are kept, um, and some people may keep animals for pleasure purposes, um, not for gain. Um, good animal standards are really important. Um, looking after the farm environment, looking after good social conditions with staff, and all of these things are production principles which really farmers should be aiming for. And maintaining and developing existing farm features. So we've got trees, we need to look after them. So um, avoiding pest and disease problems, really the rotation always comes at the top of the list. And you'll see there's a kind of a, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, really, because it's the same elements which influence how you're going to manage pest and disease problems. And at the heart of everything, really, is the help of the soil. And for that, you need the rotation. You need good husbandry. So you need to be able to manage the crop in the right way. You need to be able to make sure you plant it at the right time, that you sow it at the right time, that you move it at the right time, because many of our crops are sown as transplants and then planted out. You need to give it the right conditions. You need to make sure it's got good moisture. You need to make sure it's protected from wind, protected from other things. Um, so husbandry is a really important element in terms of encouraging good soil health. Um, <clears throat> making sure that you have the right crop for soil and site. I mean, we have some of our crops are not ideal for this soil. Um, you know, we grow parsnips and carrots, which are quite difficult to get out in the winter because of the, the, the nature of our soil, which is clay loam. Um, that's not ideal, but we, we, you know, we do it because we have a market for that and we, we need those crops, but it's not the ideal crop for this, this, this field. Um, we need to consider the whole farm as part of this pest and disease um, control. Um, again, it's really about looking at the farm as a as a complete system and thinking of, thinking about the farm as a as a as a complete organism, really, and not just um, something which is, you know, we're not bolting on we're not bolting on extras here. Um, we're making sure that the farm is a complete and total system. I seem to have lost my PowerPoint somewhere. I don't know what's happened here. Um, Tamara, could you just bear with me one minute while I try and get my PowerPoint back? Can everybody hear me all right? Nobody's answering. Tamara? Yeah, I can hear you saying, yeah. Could you come and have a look here a minute? Just one minute while I try and sort this out. <clears throat> I've lost my slide show. Oh yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> a bit of a, a technical hitch. Um, yeah, so you know, avoiding pest. Yeah, avoiding. 
avoiding pest disease problems is, is a critical issue for, for any, any farm, obviously. Um, oh, it's not moving on again. Um, something's gone wrong. Can't move it. Oh, no. Oh, it's in here. Why is it changed? I wonder. Well, I usually go forward and backwards here, but it's not doing anything. Try this one. Okay, that one. All right, I still haven't taken a problem. Um, yeah, the understory um, is a really important element to, to what we're doing. This is a picture really taken in our green mule crops, one of our green mule crops in the spring. And this diversity of flowers is, is critical to, to what we manage to do on the farm to control pests and disease. The more insects we have on the farm, the more secure I feel about the whole situation of pests and disease attack, because the greater the variety of insects, the greater the number of predators and the less the pests are going to become a problem. So this is really, um, you know, where we've got to. Oh, I've gone wrong way. Um, flowering crops are also really important. In brassicas, we've controlled our main brassica pests by allowing brassicas to flower in the spring. And this is something that very few growers actually would do. And they would feel possibly like they're leaving the field looking messy if they did, because allowing these flowers to come on in the spring, make sure that the, the predators have somewhere to go. They've also got nectar, which is really important to them. But more importantly, the, the overwintering predators is on, on the lower leaves of these brassicas. Once we've cut the crop, we cut the cabbage, they regrow and we get this incredible flowering flush. And this is really important, not just for encouraging the predators, but also in terms of producing biodiversity in other areas, but also it produces carbon, it also looks okay, um, and it becomes a, a green manure crop. So, you know, flowering crops is a critical part. We don't mow this off until it's completely finished flowering and about to set seed. The value of weeds, again, really, it's about encouraging the right sort of insects. And this is nettle. And nettle is one of the most valuable contributors to biological pest control and we allow them to grow a lot around close to our tunnels in, in the wall garden um, because nettles have a very specific aphid which only comes to nettles it starts very early in the year it starts February or March and that encourages predators to come in these, these are actually shield bugs that don't actually live on aphid they just hang around but the, the idea really is to encourage the diversity to eat the pests and then they move off somewhere else in most into our crops and the, the way we manage hedgerows is really important. The hedgerows, we have a lot of hedgerows on the two fields we have on 18 acres. We've got um, almost 2,000 metres, almost two kilometres of hedgerow because our fields are quite small. And these hedgerows are really important, diverse habitat for a range of plants and insects. The greater the number of plants, the greater the number of insects. And we manage, we manage these hedgerows in a very specific way. We only cut them on the face every third or fourth year. We don't cut the top, we land to grow up full height. Um, and we allow a, a strip of uncut vegetation below the hedge, which is usually between one and two meters wide. And we allow it to flower and set seed um, and only mow it very occasionally. And when we do mow it, the idea is to spread uh, the seeds along so that it will continue to grow in other parts of the, of the hedge. So hedgerow management is really important because hedgerows are such an important uh, breeding ground for a range of uh, insects, which are really important to, to us in terms of pest control. Um, heavy carbon is something we've added to the farm in, in the last sort of 20 years. We, we did plant a hedge. The bottom, bottom small insect picture is a hedge I planted um, over 30 years ago. This was taken after about 15 years. Um, it's quite sad really to reflect on the fact that I am the only farmer in, in this parish to have planted a hedge in more than 100 years. 
Um, there's been plenty taken out, but there's been none planted apart from this one. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities for hedge planting. This one I've planted up to, to look as if it's been there for a long time. It's diverse mix of different species with groups of trees every 30, 40 meters. Uh, it also happens to contain our, our irrigation points. So it's a useful place for, for that as well. And it's become very useful because we also coppice it. We, we, we take ramule chip wood from this for use on our fields. But heavy carbon is, is really important because we're able to harvest this carbon um, and use it for fatigue building on the, on the fields. Um, this, that was the hedge we planted, and this was cut. Um, this is Stefan from Canada. This picture is about 20, 25 years old. This is the first time we cut it. It was the first coppicing ever. Um, it's now a very thick hedge. It's producing a lot of material. We get firewood plus a whole lot of ramule chip wood as well. So we're using hedges very much as part of the, of the farm system. And that goes for our agro forestry as well, where we planted over 600 trees in, in strips in the field. And that's now about to start producing wood chip as well. So we're going to be harvesting that quite soon. Um, and shelter belts around the field, we've added a lot of shelter belts. This is one I planted um, almost 20 years ago and this picture was taken probably about three or four years after planting this shelter belt is now about 30 foot or 10 meters tall it's, it's quite productive there's a mixture of trees in there some of which are fruiting trees and some nut trees in fact we've started to coppice some of these trees as well they're becoming really useful now in terms of producing fiber um, for fertility building um, and the wood chip uh, we have several sources of which we have our own which comes from our hedgerows which we coppice uh, and also we have a, a coppice area of, of willow but also we do get some from a local tree surgeon who comes um, quite regularly dumps the load off this is built up into windrows we compost it for about 12 months before it gets used it usually gets most of it gets spread onto the green manure crops in the field. We don't spread onto bare soil ever. We only spread onto a green manure crop. Some goes for the production of substrate for plant raising. We, we make about 10, 12 cubic meters a year for plant raising. This is incredibly successful and we've done a lot of trials on this. It's, it's working really well. We've been doing this for over 20 years. We get fantastic results from plant raising in, in this material. So this has become a really useful source of carbon. Um, we are increasingly planting more and more trees with the idea really that we can be completely um, self-sufficient in terms of carbon. And we're looking at around 20% of the farm area needs to be in trees in order to provide enough carbon to, to maintain and improve our carbon content of the soil. And here we have, um, this is our coppice with the machinery there. We have a contractor, a local contractor comes in for a day, <clears throat> year, he, he does a row of coppicing in our willow. We have um, 120 willow trees planted on a very wet piece of the farm, which was not at all suitable for planting anything on. It was increasingly getting flooded. Um, so we planted this willow about 20 years ago. It's incredibly productive. We get um, a huge amount of material from that every year. Some goes for firewood, the bigger stuff goes for fire, but all the small material goes for chip. And there you can see it going into the we have a really old muck spreader. Uh, and then the bottom right picture is where it's spread. It's, it's spread quite thinly. This is not a large amount. This is around seven cubic, um, 70 cubic meters per hectare or around, it's about seven millimeters thick. So it's not a deep mulch at all. It goes on to, it only ever goes on to green manure crops um, in the winter. And it breaks down very rapidly. The worms just love this stuff. They really do. By in the spring or midsummer, most of this material will be broken down. The willow is really efficient at rotting. It produces a huge amount of fungal activity in the soil, which is really the real benefit of, of, of ram. This is ram your chip wood. Um, the role of microorganisms, this is a, an area of soil science or soil biology, really, to be more precise, which has been until recently almost completely ignored. Um, most agricultural students until 10 years ago would have not considered or been taught anything about biology and so they might have done a couple of hours one day and that's about it. Now, thank God, fortunately, um, the farming community have woken up to how important soil life is, particularly microorganisms, which, you know, there's a whole range of fungi and bacteria. 
Uh, and there's a lot of work now being done on this. And we've, we've had some really interesting um, studies done on our farm in, in the last few months, looking at what's happening. And we had um, DNA studies looking at what's going on in our soil, as well as deep carbon and, and other um, research projects as well. The, the biome, the soil biome is, <clears throat> is a hugely complex um, system. It's far more complex than the one that we have in our, in our stomachs, which have only, again, only really started to understand in the last 10 or 15 years. The, the gut biome is probably relatively simple compared to the soil biome. The soil biome is hugely complex. I mean, we are talking about trillions of living organisms in, in every spoonful of soil. Many, most of which have never been discovered, have not been analysed, haven't been understood. Uh, we have a potential for research here, which is probably greater than any other research potential anywhere on the planet. Uh, and it's just starting. So we're, we're starting to understand something about soil. We don't, as farmers, we don't need to know every detail. It's, it's too complex, but we do need to understand the importance of having these soil organisms. Because it's through this so organism, this soil activity that we get our fertility. This is how we are able to process our nutrients in the soil. It's the biological function of the soil, which makes our soil elements available to plants. It, we've always known about the nitrogen cycle, how that's dependent <clears throat> on, on the bacteria in the soil, the legumes to process that, that um, nitrogen. But until recently, nobody considered the fact that this all, also happens for phosphate, potash, and every other element there is in the soil. Plants would not be able to access these nutrients without the right biological function. And as soils get depleted, particularly of carbon, then this biological function is also depleted. Um, and maintaining that carbon is so important in terms of maintaining that soil biome. And soil structure is really important. This is where I, I quoted earlier on about the role of the earthworm. If the earthworm collapse from the system and what you're looking at on that picture is a big part of earthworm excrement which they've chewed up soil that's very fine soil particles that lump of soil that worm cast is much richer than the soil that surrounds it um, which would be relatively poor so these macro and micro nutrients are only available through the action of biological activity and the worm is just one of those mechanisms it's the one we can see and understand that there's other insects going on if you look at soil and it's fascinating look at soil with a hand lens it's maybe 50 magnification you'd be absolutely blown away what's going on there in a healthy soil is absolutely crawling with activity and this helps to resist the pressure of disease so good quality biome in the soil is an absolute essential element of, of everything we do on the farm this is where you know, we, we really spend a lot of effort making sure we get this, this part of the farm has to be right. And, and the worm, I've already said quite a bit about the worm and I think it's not possible to say too much. If anybody wants to learn more about soil, the first thing you have to do is learn about the worm because the worm is the, the main mechanism of, of soil production really. It's the one that creates the, the actual soil itself in terms of breaking down material. Um, improving drainage, they connect soil levels together. So worms will go very deep in the summer. This year they would have gone way down because they had a very long, very hot drought. Uh, worms disappear from the surface. They go down half a metre or even a metre deep into more moist conditions. And they all gather together in little groups of 10 or 15 all huddle together to keep, to keep damp. Um, they're really good at processing waste. They take all the material from the surface and they take it down. They remove debris. So in removing debris, they're also removing the potential for disease. There's, there's a lot of disease lying around on the soil. There's always lots of disease lying around on the soil. There needs to be lots of disease. That's part of the function of the biome is to process that disease. You need that disease to make the soil work. So they're removing debris out of the way of plants. So removing some of the problems potentially. They also reduce weed seeds. Worms have the amazing habit of collecting weed seeds up and taking them down deep in the soil and it's not quite known why they do that but it's probably it's probably a resilience mechanism to make sure that there's seeds deep in the soil so if the soil was at any time badly eroded there still would be something growing back and this is important because eroded soil if there's no weed seeds in eroded soil eroded soil gets even more eroded because there's nothing to protect it so this is worms really protecting 
our greatest and most important asset, and that's our soil. So the worm, I put the worm as being top of the list in terms of um, the natural order of things in soil. Um, it, it's not because everything's as important as, as each other, but for worms, because we understand something about them and we can kind of relate to them a bit because they are animals like us, um, it gives us the opportunity to learn a lot about our soils. And if anybody wants to know more about worms, you need to read Charles Darwin's book, which was written 150 years ago. Um, he also came up with this process technique. He, he named it natural selection, which is what I talked about earlier on, why we have pests, it's all about natural selection. But he also did a very extensive study of earthworms over quite a, a long period of, of, his, of his career. And, and that book is still the most um, important work in terms of earthworm studies been done. There is some modern work been done, but his is still the, the most important perhaps of, of all time. So worms are, are really essential. And this is the final picture. This is our, our farm shop, which was built about four or five years ago. Um, is where we sell almost half our produce. And this picture was taken by one of our, our uh, customers one, one evening um, a year or two ago. And it's built almost entirely from local materials, which have been harvested very close to here. Okay, that is the end of the show. Um, so we're going to start questions now. I think we have we have a good fifteen minutes or more. So hopefully, um, plenty of time for questions. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you, Ian. That was amazing. What an informationally packed talk and uh, full of knowledge and expertise. Thank you so much. I think we have some questions uh sam if you want to ian can we see you again so we can see your good looks yeah there you are <laughs> yeah we've got a question from Anne. um i think this may have already been covered in your talk um so if your first question Anne, if you do want to maybe reword it if you still want it to be elaborated on just let me know maybe just type in another question QA. Um, we've got a question from Norma. Uh, question on wood chips. Do you use a specific size of chip? Um, I've seen some very large chips. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we generally like um, small chips because they, they break down quicker. The, the large ones that, that may have been spotted in the picture, that was Willow, um, which doesn't always chip very well because it's quite stringy. And also, the machine at that point, the machine was probably had blunt cutters in it if the cutters are blunt they tend to make long chips which is not ideal so we generally only go for quite short chips actually was that the question was, was there another part of that question yeah that's it yeah just the sort of size of chip yeah. yeah that's great um got a question from Anne. uh when you spread the compost onto your green manures versus bare soil are you aiming to bury the green manure entirely no, that's not the intention at all. In fact, the intention is to make sure the green manure does grow through the wood chip, which is why we don't put very large amounts on at a time. Uh, we're not interested in terminating the green manure at that point in the rotation. So it's really about <clears throat> covering soil. We do it during the winter because things are dormant. It's easier to, to, to get on the field then. If it's dry, we, we take the opportunity when it's dry. But no, the idea is not, not to cover the green manure at all. Mm -hmm. Great. Um... And again, I got a question from Anne. Um, <coughs> sorry, told uh, If you had to give a few guidelines or key points to appropriate tillage, um, what would they be? And also, how do you terminate an overwintered uh, cover crop? Right. Well, appropriate tillage. Um, it's quite a big subject. This, but you know, the gen, gen, the general rule is as little as possible. The the minimum you can get away with primarily. So in our case, uh, we do plow occasionally within the rotation. We plow three years out of seven. Uh, we plow very shallow, and that's primarily to get rid of the green manure crop because they are pretty hefty crops. They need to be turned in really just so we can establish another crop. Um, on a very small scale, you wouldn't have to do this. You could do just very much surface uh, tillage, but we do need to plow on, on this scale. Um, and we use other machinery as well. We use power harrow occasionally, which everything is done very shallow. We never go more than about two inches with most cultivations. And we only do the absolute minimum necessary because every time we, we cultivate, we are doing damage. We, we appreciate that, we accept that. And the rotation is really built around the recognition of when soil is potentially getting damaged and then the process is to restore that damage as part of the rotation as it goes on. So to terminate a green manure crop it does 
vary so much depending on which crop it is and whether it's growing with a vegetable at the same time but in most cases it gets mowed off it gets flail mowed and we either shallow very shallow cultivate or if it's a much larger green manure we would plow it in order to give us bare ground where we're where we're sowing seeds direct we need clean soil we can't sow into into trash we're not arable farmers we're not dealing with cereal crops we're dealing with very very small seeds so we have to clean ground for those seeds so where we're sowing direct we will always create a stale clean seed bed for those but in some planting out situations we could plant into lots of surface trash at the same time great cool um that's all the questions for you so if anybody has any more questions we've still got some time left um in the meantime actually i was going to ask you um you mentioned about minimizing the use of uh, non-renewable uh, resources um have you had any done any experiments with uh, fuel for machinery at all and do you know any what, what's the sort of uh, direction you think it might go in no we haven't many many years ago we looked at the possibility of replacing our tractors with horses we wouldn't think of that now but we, we did then um it seemed to be an obvious choice in terms of you know removing the the, the main element of carbon on our farm is, is diesel of course we get through about a thousand liters a year it's, it's not a lot considering how much we produce um but yes it is still a carbon input and electricity which is another quite large carbon input and the horse thing we looked at the horse thing which is quite interesting because it turned out that we would the bottom line was we'd only produce half the amount of food we produce now and it would cost us three and a half times more than it does now so food costs would have to go up by about six or seven times to cover the cost of that and okay. that's looking at you know horsepower scenario which we wouldn't consider now um if we're looking at other alternatives and yeah we have looked at the idea of an electric tractor they are phenomenally expensive um they contain a massive amount of carbon in the batteries far more than than our tractor will ever use in its diesel lifetime so that doesn't appear to be such a great idea either the the only viable carbon almost carbon neutral alternative is hand labor um and mm -hmm. you know to to do that would mean a staggeringly high increase in in our food costs by a factor which most people would not even consider as uh, being financially viable so it is a really difficult one and at the moment we are kind of stuck with diesel i don't see that changing i mean we you know we use far less than a comparable conventional farmer would be using but we still need that diesel it's very important and the electricity which is primarily used for plant raising in terms of um, some light and some background heat and the benching uh, is another one which is really difficult to to supply alternatives to we could we could invest in solar but it would be a huge massive investment for us i mean we would need to spend in the region of about 60 70 thousand pounds the business would never get that money back so you know we have quite difficult decisions to make on the farm we are a commercial operation we don't get supported by any we don't get any money at all from the government for what we do not a single penny there's no support at all for what we do so we have to take quite difficult financial decisions um, about the farm and, and energy is one of them and to to invest in solar or wind um, for us is not a viable option it would it would never pay back in beyond my lifetime we're looking at 30 35 year payback time that could change and it is changing there because the cost of electricity has gone up quite dramatically but what we're doing this year we're just reducing how many plants we we, we raise in that system and doing more peg plants so there, you know we can find a way around that part of it but the you know the prime energy mover for most of the field production the garden is different because it's mostly by hand but the garden the field production where we're producing the bulk of our vegetables is still dependent on diesel and at the moment we do not have a viable alternative to that other than hand hand work or horsepower i mean horsepower is perfectly doable it happened during the war a lot you know but there are ethical questions around that which i think a lot of people would, would want to um have you know maybe a debate about and i would be quite happy to, to talk about that too but horses do offer a viable alternative in the practical sense but it does put the price up quite dramatically mm, yeah there's a lot to think about there um, there is a lot to think about i mean we yeah. would only you know we'd have to we'd, we'd need two horses at least you know possibly four really and that takes up a lot of land you know that, that would take <laughs> up 
a third of our land instantly goes into into grazing for horses you know um and then there's other costs on top of that um you know labor costs um you know there's a lot of additional labor involved in that um and labor for us is it's a critical factor um it's very hard to get labor for farms now it's very difficult to get people working on farms now the wages are quite low um you know people don't like these sort of work very much anymore. They've got other things much easier. Um, and vegetable production is, is incredibly labor intensive. 40% of our turnover, um, that's the farm turnover totally goes on, on wages. And on some mm -hmm. crops, it can be more than the value of the crop, which, you know, then brings the question why, why do we grow that crop? Well, it's, you know, some years it just doesn't pay so well. But, you know, labor is a critical factor for us. We, we really struggle to get people to pick strawberries. It's become a point where, you know, we're not sure how much longer we can carry on growing strawberries because we cannot get people to pick them. It's as, it's critical as that. And this is a story which is you hear right across agriculture. I don't know if you follow, you know, the conventional agriculture world at all, but, you know, the big, the big, big question now is who is going to be picking these crops in, in the next 12 months? Because yeah, mm -hmm. we'll not have any labour sorted out for next year's crop at all. And this is a serious, serious worry. You know, if we're going to try and produce food in this country for everybody, we're going to have to find people to do some of the work. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What would, some... be your, what would be your solution to that, Ian? Um, is it to, you know, supplement agricultural wages that the government would subsidise those wages? Or, you know, I was on a panel uh, the other week and somebody referred to your farm and they asked me, is, is uh, Tallhurst Organic, is it scalable? Uh, you know, is it, could it be scaled up? Could it be replicable? And so what you're mentioning there about labour is, is going to be a real factor. Yeah, um, I mean, in a perverse sort of way, scaling up is actually a better solution because we could get them more machinery, better machinery to replace a lot of what is presently done by hand. So the larger scale, you need to be growing crops on quite a large scale to do that. I mean, you need to take a, you know, we're harvesting carrots by hand at the moment. Um, large growers would be using a machine. That machine costs about £200,000. Uh, it's really fast. I mean, you know, we have three two people who in a day may harvest 400 kilograms of carrots uh, that machine would do that in a minute literally in a minute possibly even more so you know scaling up in some sense i'm rather reluctant to say that scaling up in, in that way would actually bring those costs down quite significantly which is why farms have have got so big this is why farms are so big because they need to bring those machinery costs down um, it's not really the sort of farm I would want to manage, but it is. there's no technical or agronomic reason at all why our farm couldn't be scaled up to a thousand hectares. There's, there's no reason at all against that. And it would actually be probably um, certainly more cost effective. I don't think it would be more productive per hectare. It would probably go down, actually, but it would still be much more financially viable in, on a larger scale. So it is scalable. It wouldn't be a thousand acre field. It would be a large field divided up into smaller units. But you know, it would still it would still work, and it would still be a agronomically viable and sustainable um, business. And it may and it would definitely pay um, better wages than than perhaps we we're able to pay. I mean, we only paid just slightly better than minimum wage. In terms of you know how how farms are going to be run in the future, well, nearly all farms are subsidised already. We're not because we're too small. Um, but most farms are subsidised. You know, my neighbour, he, he gets 80% of his income comes from farm subsidies. And they're all worried now because they're not sure what's going to happen in the future. Those subsidies are in, in serious question in England at the moment. So in order to keep the price of food down, farms have always been subsidised. And, you know, it's all very well for people to talk about increasing the price of food to a realistic level because what we're selling now is only a third of the price it was 45 years ago. I mean, we're selling strawberries at a third the price we sold them 45 years ago in real terms. And, you know, you wonder how much longer that can continue for. And if we were to put food back to a realistic price, it would go up a huge amount. People talk about the price of food going up 10% in the last three or four months. I mean, to put it back to its, its real value, it would go up by almost two or three times. This is a staggeringly high figure. And people are not used to paying that <laughs> food so it has to be subsidized and it's really down to the central government to do that they're going to have to look after farms in the way they have in the past 
looked after farms which are producing crops, which a lot of people don't actually want anyway, um, they're going to have to start producing you know, money to subsidise farms, which are going to feed people in a, in a more direct way rather than through livestock. Mm. Yeah, I absolutely agree on that one, uh, Ian. We've just got a couple more quick questions. Do you think we can do these questions, Sam? Sure. Yeah, I think they're quite fast. Don't um, mind. Yeah, we've also got a lot of thanks in the comments as well for, uh, for your talk. Uh, so Norm is asking, essentially only disturb the top two inches of the soil, um, how do you plant potatoes? Sorry, could you say that again? Um, essentially only disturb the top two inches of soil, how do you plant potatoes? Well, in that case, we have to disturb more than the top two inches. We are going, we are going down five inches deep with potatoes. So that's done by machine. I mean, potato is a really good example of mechanisation. We, we, we've mechanised the whole growing process. The harvesting, we still do a lot by hand, but the actual growing process we've mechanised is really straightforward and very easy. So, yeah, we are planting potatoes deeper. Great. And then last question. <clears throat> um, do you uh, save the compost for your nursery uh, or is it fine enough after 12 months? Yes, we do. We do sieve. It goes through a 10 millimetre grader. Um, it's more than 12 months old compost for substrate plant substrate material is near <coughs> to maybe 18 months or possibly even two years old it's a much more broken down material so it's a very very mature widget compost and that primarily means it goes through a grader very well it's kept dry we keep it covered so it goes through very easily um, and the bits that come out are basically bits of wood that have rotted and it's a relatively small amount. So yes, we, we do sieve. It has to be sieved because it's going into quite a small module. There is a danger with wood chip substrate. And if you leave bits of wood in there, you will rob the nitrogen from the from the module that the plant's grown in, which would give a very bad plant. So yes, we, we sieve out all the, all the big bits. Great. That's the, the end of the questions. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, probably like everyone else listening, I'm very thankful that this site's going to be recorded. It was recorded and it'll be up at the link uh, stockfreefarming.org slash beyond hyphen the hyphen possible tomorrow. So you can review it again and uh, learn more from listening to it the second time. Sam, are we able to share that last slide? Um, um, yeah, it should be up soon if possible. So we're coming to the end of our webinar series. We have one more webinar to go that is next Tuesday and it's on the topic of forestry. We're going to have Angus Dixon who is our own in-house uh, forestry advisor and along with James Hepburn Scott from Forest Carbon. They're going to talk about the different forestry schemes that are available uh, particularly in Scotland and also demystify the whole carbon credit thing. So that should be a really interesting talk if you're contemplating uh, forestry. Um, doesn't look like that last slide is going to come up, does it? Uh, if you have any other oh, questions, okay. if you have any other questions for Ian, you can uh, email me at rebecca at stockfreefarming.org or contact at stockfreefarming.org and I will pass those on. Uh, Ian is a member of our Stock Free Advisory team, so we'll be able to pass those questions on to Ian if you missed asking anything tonight. Um, thank you so much again to Ian. Uh, it was just an amazing talk. Thanks everyone for coming along and we hope to see you back next Tuesday and have a good evening everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye -bye. Ian. Thanks, everyone. Bye, -bye. bye, everyone. Thank you.